Hello and welcome to a new video from Joggler66, Hour of the Truth. Today again I've come here to read another part of the wonderful, for most people unknown, a often suppressed book, The Secret History of the Jesuits, from Edmond Paris, from 1975, when it was published. This is really, this is really a wonderful book on the suppressed history of the Jesuits. I have read Rulers of Evil, which deals a lot with the Jesuits, of course, for the United States of America, my brethren over there, the book from F. Tapper Saucy, and this one also deals with the Jesuits a little bit more in the European version, because Edmond Paris, or Edmond Paris, was a French author. Anyway, um, as you learned in the last part, there is a lot, of course, of the French view that he tells us about the secret history of the Jesuits. But now we are going into, an inter uh, into a more international realm because we are dealing with the preparation years before World War I and then World War II, or the Second Thirty-Year War, as I like to call it. And keep in mind that these wars were incited, initiated by the, Ro by the Roman Catholic Church through the Jesuit order, which we will learn while we are reading this here, and they are nothing else but a crusade. They are a quote-unquote holy war. Because there are a lot of people who say, yeah, but you know, when Germany was told by the, uh, by, uh, the Pope Leo XIII, um, to be the sword of the Roman Catholic Church, why then were the Germans defeated? Well, that is only because people who ask these questions do not understand that, that the Jesuits always stand on both sides. And um, in the end, the church must win. So the church takes two enemies of it, and instead of fighting them themselves, they incite these two against each other and let them kill each other off. And that's what the Second World War was. Germany, an enemy, because it was the northern of Germany, was Protestant, an enemy of the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. Russia, an enemy, because they were Orthodox. And there are so many other reasons why they are enemies of the Roman Catholic Church. The same with the United States of America. Protestant and, of course, the second beast of Revelation 13. Protestants in England and people in France who did not want to adhere to Ultramontanism, as we have learned already in reading this book. So this is why I'm going to continue now in the next part of this book, The Secret History of the Jesuits from Edmond Paris. And we continue on page 109 in the PDF in the start of chapter 9, still of course in uh, part uh, or section 4 of the book. Uh, which deals with the European history of the Jesuits, and this chapter 9 is called The Years Before the War. We are dealing with the years between 1900 and 1914. So, as wrote the Abbé Brugret, quote, Under the image of Jesus crucified, divine symbol of the idea of justice, la croix means the cross, that's a magazine, a newspaper in France, had passionately cooperated with the work of deception and of the uh, and of crime against truth, uprightness and justice. Unquote. Yeah, of course, because La Croix is a Catholic newspaper, and they were, of course, also involved in the conspiracy of the Dreyfus affair that we read of earlier. Justice had nevertheless triumphed in the end. And the Abbé Frémont, who did not fear mentioning the sinister crusade led by Antichrist Pope Innocent III against the Albigenses, when referring to the affair, seemed to be a true prophet when he said, quote, The Catholics are winning and they think they will overthrow the Republic because of the hatred for the Jews. But they will, I am afraid, only overthrow themselves, unquote. In fact, when opinion was enlightened, the reaction was fatal. Ronk had learned the lesson of the affair when he exclaimed, quote, 
the Republic will break the power of the congregations, or she will be strangled. Unquote. In 1899, a Ministry of Republican Defense was constituted. Father Picard, superior of the Assumptionists, Father Bailly, a Bailly, director of La Croix, and ten other members of that order were brought to trial before the Tribunal of the Seine for breach of the law on associations. The congregation of the Assumptionists was dissolved. Valdec Rousseau, president of the council, declared in a speech pronounced at Toulouse on the 28th of October 1900, quote, dispersed but not suppressed, the religious orders formed themselves again. Bigger in numbers and more militant, they cover the territory with a network of political organization whose links are innumerable and tightly knit, as we have seen through a recent trial, unquote. At last, in 1901, a law is passed ruling that no congregation can be formed without an authorization and that those who do not ask for it within the legal time will be automatically dissolved. It will be these, con er, these regulations quite natural on the part of public authorities whose duty it is to check the associations found in their territory which will be presented to the Catholics as an intolerable abuse. Quote, a man's house is his castle, unquote, goes the saying, but the church is not having any of it. The common law is not for her. No, the civil law is not ruling in the church, because the church, the Roman Catholic church, outside of which there is no salvation, as she claims, has her canon law, and the canon law of the Roman Catholic church is above the civil law or the common law. Common law has no grip on the Roman Catholic Church. That is why, even today, pedophile priests will not be judged by our civil courts. That is why our prisons are maybe full of pedophiles but empty of priests. Even though all these pedophile priests should be taken to prison because they are working, quote-unquote, working for the church, and the church says that the common law, the civil law, has no power over the spiritual law, they are outside of the law. And that, of course, is the, um, is the basis, is the source of so much evil, especially in the Roman Catholic Church. Why? Because they all have carte blanche, don't you get it? When you are a member of the Roman Catholic Church, of the clergy, you have carte blanche to do whatever you want, because the normal laws do not apply to you, and you are under the protection of the Pope and of the Roman Catholic canon law, which stands above the common law. But let's continue. The resistance of the clerics to the application of the law would be enough to show how necessary it was. This resistance will only strengthen the government's attitude, especially under Minister Combe. And Rome's intransigence, especially when Antichrist Pope, uh, Pope Pius the this must be um, the 11th, succeeded to Leo the 13th, will bring about the law of 1904, abolishing the teaching orders. Uh, because it was Pope Pius the 11th and then later Pope Pius the 12th, so this is a uh, printing error when he stands Pius the 1st. Okay? That must read Pius the 11th. He succeeded Leo the 13th, and Leo the 13th is that Antichrist. I'm gonna, I can show you a picture of him even if you want to. Um, Leo the 13th is that Antichrist that, uh, according to the uh, memoirs of the German emperor uh, who reigned in Germany between. 1869, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, 1999, uh, 1919, sorry, the end of uh, World War One. 
This Antichrist, Pope Leo XIII, told the Emperor that he wants the Germans to be the sword of the Roman Catholic Church in the coming world wars. And that is recorded in the memoirs of the Kaiser, of the German Emperor. Okay? So, when we read here about, almost a little bit casually, about Pope Leo XIII, Antichrist Pope Leo XIII, you should know what kind of a man he was. And that's the kind that I just told you. Okay, so we're going to continue. After that, friction between the French government and the Holy See will be constant. Besides, the election of the new Pope was done in significant circumstances. Quote, Antichrist Pope Leo XIII died on the 20th of July in 1903. The conclave meeting to designate his successor gives, after several ballots, 29 votes for Cardinal Rampolla. 42 are needed to be elected. When the Austrian Cardinal Puscina stands up and declares that His Apostolic Majesty, the Emperor of Austria, King of Hungary, is inspired <laughs> by you officially to exclude the Secretary of State to Leo XIII. We know that Cardinal Rampolla is pro-French. Cardinal Sarto is elected. Through the maneuver of Austria, which substituted itself for the Holy Spirit to inspire the cardinals of the conclave, yeah, because the Roman Catholic Church claims apostolic succession from one pope to another, and when you read my, or when you follow my reading of Babylon Mystery Religion that I did on my channel, the book from Ralph Woodrow, you can only laugh about apostolic succession, because there is no such thing and that the new Pope is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Well, <laughs> what do we read here? Through the maneuver in Austria we just read, which substituted itself for the Holy Spirit to inspire the cardinals of the conclave, this election is a victory for the Jesuits. So, this maneuver in Austria actually takes over the work of the Holy Spirit in the Vatican. So much for apostolic succession, right? Indeed, the author continues, the new pontiff described as a mixture of village priest and archangel with a fiery, uh, with a fiery sword, unquote, is the perfect type of man wished for by the order of the Jesuits. This is what Monsieur Adrien Danset says about it, and we had already read numerous quotes of him. This is another one. Quote, when we love the Pope, we do not limit the field in which he can and must exercise his will. Unquote. Or this from his first consistorial address. Quote, we know that we will shock many people when we declare that we will necessarily be involved in politics. But anyone wanting to judge fairly can see that the sovereign pontiff, invested by God with the supreme authority, doesn't have the right to separate politics from the domain of faith and morals. Unquote. Now, isn't this an interesting sentence? Some people who say, oh, the Pope has no political power, oh, the Roman Catholic Church is not political. If you didn't understand it as far as we have gone already in these all readings here of this book and all the other book readings, then sentence like this is writing on the wall. Adrien Danset is quoted here as saying, quote, We know that we will shock many people when we declare that we will necessarily be involved in politics. Okay, so when we, the Roman Catholic Church, tell people that we, uh, we are declaring to them that it will be necessary that we are involved in politics, we will shock many people, but anyone wanting to judge fairly can see that the sovereign pontiff, Pontifex Maximus, the vicar of Christ, the antichrist of the Bible, invested by quote-unquote God, this should be with a small g of course, with a supreme authority, 
doesn't have the right to separate politics from the domain of faith and morals means even the Pope does not have the power to separate church and state. That's what this says here. So Pius X, um, again that must be Pius XI if I'm not mistaken, as soon as he had acceded to St. Peter's throne, publicly declared for or, or Pius the Tenth, sorry, yeah, that's probably right. Um, because during the Second World War we had uh, Benedict the Fifteenth and Pius the Eleventh was in the time of the nineteen twenty nine, the Lateran Treaty and the beginning of the World War Two until nineteen thirty nine. So this must probably be right here. So Pius X, as the author says here, as soon as he had acceded to St. Peter's throne, publicly declared that, for him, the Pope's authority must be felt in every domain, means spiritually and temporally, and that political clericalism is not only a right, but political clericalism, clericalism is a duty. He also chose for his Secretary of State a Spanish prelate, Monsignor Mary del Valle, who was 38 years old and, like him, passionately pro-German and anti-French. Now, this state of mind is not surprising when we read these words from the Abbé Fremont. Quote, Marie del Valle, whom I met at the Roman College, was the Jesuits' favorite pupil." Unquote. The relations between the Holy See and France soon felt the effects of that choice, because Marie del Valle was pro-German and anti-France, or anti-French. Okay? First of all, it was the nomination of bishops by the civil power which brought about a conflict. Well, that's something that we have even until today. There is a lot of quarrel between the Roman Catholic Church and China because China took the right to appoint bishops. But only the Pope says that he has the right to appoint bishops. So, there is a conflict. And that same conflict we have over here in France because... France never accepted the temporal power of the Pope, only the spiritual power. So France said we have a republic and we have the power to nominate bishops. Now follows a quote. Before the war of 1870, the Holy See learned the names of the new bishops only after they had been nominated. The Pope reserved the right, if one was not acceptable to him, to stop him being a bishop by withholding the canonical institution. In fact, the difficulties were enormous, as the governments under any kind of regime were careful to elect candidates worthy of the episcopal office. Unquote. As soon as Pius X was Pope, most of the nominations for new bishops were refused by Rome. Besides, the nuncio in Paris, Lorenzelli, was as we are told by Monsieur Adrien Dancet, quote, a theologian who has gone astray in diplomacy and madly hostile to France, unquote. Some will say, just another one added to all the others. Another one bites the dust? <laughs> but such a choice for such a post clearly shows what were the intentions of the Roman Curia towards our country. This systematic hostility was going to show itself even more clearly in 1904, when Monsieur Loubet, President of the Republic, went to Rome to return the visit paid to him in Paris some time before by the King of Italy, Victor Emmanuel III. Monsieur Loubet wished to be received by the Pope also, but the Roman Curia produced a supposed invincible protocol. Quote, the Pope could not receive a head of state who when visiting the king of Italy in Rome, seemed to, acknowledge, uh, seemed to acknowledge as lawful the usurpation of that ancient pontifical state. But there were precedents. Twice, in 1888 and in 1903, a head of state, and not one of the less important, had been received in Rome by the king of Italy and by the Antichrist, the Pope. Of course, this visitor was not the president of a republic, 
but the German Emperor Guillaume the Second. The same honour had been given to Edward the Seventh, King of England and the Tsar. The insulting intention of that refusal was evident and even emphasized by, uh, emphasized by a note sent to the various chancelleries by the Secretary of State Mary, uh, State Mary Delval. A Catholic author, M. Charles Ledre, recently wrote this concerning the matter. Quote, Could the pontifical diplomacy ignore the decisively important objective which, behind the visit of President Lubé to Rome, was really taking shape? Unquote. Of course. The Vatican knew about the plan to separate Italy from her partners of the Triple Alliance. Germany and Austria-Hungary, these two Germanic powers considered by the Roman Church to be her best secular arms. This was the very crux of the matter, and was, in fact, the reason for the Vatican's frequent bursts of temper. Other conflicts arose concerning French bishops considered in Rome to be too republican. At last, tired of the constant difficulties arising from the Vatican's infringements of the terms of the Concordat, the French government put an end on the 29th of July 1904 to relations which were made void by the Holy See. The breaking of diplomatic relations was bound to lead, soon after, to the separation of church and state. We find it normal today, wrote Adrien Donset, that France should maintain diplomatic relations with the Holy See, and that state and church should live under the regime of separation. Diplomatic relations are necessary as France must be represented wherever she had interests to defend, outside any doctrinal consideration. But separation is, necess uh, is necessary as, in a democracy founded on the sovereignty of a people divided by several beliefs, the state only owes liberty to the church. And the author adds, this is at least the general opinion. We can only agree with this reasonable opinion without forgetting, of course, that the papacy will never endorse it. The Roman Church never stopped proclaiming her preeminence over civil history throughout her own history, and, for want of being able to impose it openly in recent times, she has done her best to implant it with the help of her secret army, the Company of Jesus. Besides, it was at the time that Father Werns, general of this order, yeah, uh, Werns was a German uh, general of the Society of Jesus in the beginning of the 20th century. This Father Werns wrote, quote, The state is under the church's jurisdiction, so secular authority is indeed under the subjection of ecclesiastical authority and has to obey. Now, isn't this a nice sentence by Father Werns, the Jesuit general, the black pope that we read here? Isn't that confirming what I said earlier and what I said in so many other videos and which you always hear also when you listen to Tom Fress? And isn't this even the same that Martin Luther was already proclaiming in 1520? When he wrote, um, when he wrote uh, the paper on the German nobility, the three walls the Romanists put around them. Yeah. One of the walls was that the Roman Catholic Church stated in, and this is what Luther wrote in 1520, that the Roman Catholic Church says that. The spiritual power is above the temporal. And now we have Father Werns, the general of the Society of Jesus, saying, quote, The state is under the church's jurisdiction. So secular authority is indeed under the subjection of ecclesiastical authority, even though there is a little type fault, type fault, but it says authority, and has to obey the 
secular authority has to obey the ecclesiastical authority. So who is reigning your country, let me ask you. When you read this, and the society of Jesus does not only rule in France and Germany, they also rule in the United States of America. And when the general of the society of Jesus says here, secular authority is under the subjection of ecclesiastical authority, who rules your country? Do you really think that that puppet like Obama or Trump for the moment in the United States of America rules your country? No, he is just a puppet for the ecclesiastical authority behind him. When you go to my YouTube channel and you watch that video, they are laughing at you. You see that. When you go to my video series of Hour of the Truth, Donaldos Tramfios, you see that. Also in the United States of America, the spiritual power has the temporal power in subjection. And the temporal, the civil power has to obey the spiritual power. Father Wern says this year in the beginning of the 20th century as the, sec as the uh, general of the Society of Jesus, the quote-unquote Black Pope, and that was so 500 years before when Martin Luther did that claim already, and that is still today in 2017. Wake up, people! When you do not know this church, study it, and then you will understand it, and then you know where all the atrocities come from. That's the point that I want to make. That's the point why we are reading the secret history of the Jesuits. You see, secret, it's not open. It's kept from you. Father Werns says this, but does he say that openly and is that to read in every newspaper the next morning? No! But it is said to the people who rule, it is said to the people in the know, And it is published even in official Roman Catholic papers, but nobody ever reads that. Because, oh, mm, ah, I, I, I rather read uh, the newspaper, or I rather play with my cell phone, or I rather use my tablet for this and that, or I'm on social media, or I'm gonna watch football, or baseball, or basketball, or football, or Formula One, or Olympics, or I don't know, whatever they put in front of you, that you do not read these things, that you do not understand these things, and by that there is a secret history that rules our world, and you do not know it when you do not study these points. The Black Pope, the General of the Order of the Society of Jesus, the Compagnie de Jesus, says the state is under the Church's jurisdiction. So, secular authority is indeed under the subjection of ecclesiastical authority and has to obey. Unquote. That is the doctrine of these intransigent champions of theocracy. Counselors as well as those who execute their commands, who made themselves indispensable at the Vatican. So much so that today, and we are speaking about the middle of the 19th, uh, 20th century, it would be absolutely impossible to distinguish even the smallest difference between the Black Pope and the White Pope. They are one and the same. Now, what else does confirm that the Black Pope and the White Pope are one and the same? When you read the Constitutions of the Jesuits, and there are books out there, you can read it for yourselves, then you know that in the Jesuit order, it is, I think, in the Constitutions 500 times repeated, that the Black Pope must be addressed as the Vicar of Christ. Vicarius Filii Dei. That's the same title the white pope claims for himself. The Antichrist. He claims for himself the title 
Antichrist instead of Jesus Christ. He takes the place of Jesus Christ. That title, Vicarius Filidei, also works for the Black Pope. And when that works for the Black Pope and the White Pope, well, we can see, as the author says here, they are the same. It is absolutely, or it would be absolutely impossible to distinguish even the smallest difference between the Black Pope and the White Pope. They are one and the same. And when we refer to the politics of the Vatican, we simply mean the Jesuits' politics. With many other qualified observers, the Abbe Fremont admits it as follows, quote, The Jesuits dominate the Vatican. Unquote. And this is another quote that we can read in Anje Siegfried in this book on page 421. Before the irreducible opposition of the Jesuits, all powerful in the Church to the Republic, the State is constrained to enforce the law of separation with several amendments from 1905 to 1908. This law does not want to decrease the Church's wealth and her buildings set up for worship. The faithful can form themselves into local associations under the direction of the priest to manage them. What's Rome going to do? The encyclical letter Vehementa from the 11th of February 1906, Antichrist Pope Pius X condemned the principle of separation and the one pertaining to the local associations. But does he go beyond the principles? We will soon know. In spite of the advice from the French Episcopate, he rejects all settlement on the 10th of August 1906 in the encyclical letter Gravissimo. This is another disappointment for the liberal Catholics. Quote, when I think, acclaimed Brunetière, that was refused, that what is refused to the French Catholics with the certain knowledge that such refusal will unleash a religious war in our poor country, which needs peace so much, is granted to the German Catholics that the local associations have been operating there for 30 years to everyone's satisfaction, I cannot help, as a patriot as well as a Catholic, feeling most indignant." Unquote. There was some trouble, in fact, when an inventory of ecclesiastical properties was taken, but not a religious war. Even though the Ultramontanes were stirring up trouble, the population as a whole remained calm when some of the church's property were returned to the state by her, rather than submit to the conciliatory measures laid down by the law. Did then the writer Brunetier understand... <coughs> Did then the brighter Brunetier understand fully the reason for that difference in which the French Catholics and the German Catholics were treated by the Holy See? The First World War was to reveal all the significance of it. While the Jesuits had effectually worked through the Dreyfus affair at dividing the French people and weakening the prestige of our army in Germany, they were doing the exact opposite. Bismarck, who himself had launched in the past the Kulturkampf, means culture struggle, against the Roman Catholic Church, was being loaded with her favors. Now, if you do not know who Bismarck is, I don't know if I showed him before in this book reading, let's take a look at a picture of Bismarck. Bismarck was the one, he, in Germany he was called der Eiserne Kanzler, meaning the Iron Chancellor. And um, this Otto von Bismarck, who lived and died near Hamburg, I have visited that place because I come from Hamburg originally. He was called the Eiserne Kanzler, means the Iron Chancellor. He was the one who formed the, the Second German Reich in 1871 after the war against France. And 
he was a Prussian and he was a Protestant and he had a culture war with the Pope. A cultural war. Why? Because the Pope was Catholic and he was Protestant. Okay? And he founded the Protestant Second German Reich. Yeah? That Protestant Second German Reich was founded in 1871 and in 1872 he threw out the Jesuits, closed monasteries and cloisters and churches and Jesuit universities and everything else. Yeah? That was Bismarck, whom you see here in picture. And here is a memorial that stands in Hamburg of him. And here you have a picture of Bismarck and Pope Leo XIII in their, this is a caricature of course, of their culture struggle. And here you have the first paparazzi photo ever made and that is Bismarck in his deathbed. Uh, he is dead at the moment that this picture is taken. Yeah? So when we are speaking here about the Kulturkampf, the culture camp or the uh, the culture war, Bismarck himself, who had in the past launched the culture war because he went to war against Rome, he went to war against the Antichrist, has been loaded with her favors. This is what we are told by the Catholic writer Joseph Rovan, who also explains it. Quote, Bismarck will be the first Protestant to receive the quote-unquote order of Christ with jewels, one of the highest honors of the church. The German government allows newspapers devoted to it to publish the fact that the Chancellor would be ready effectually to uphold the Pope's pretensions of a partial restoration of his temporal authority. Unquote. In 1886, the center which is a German Catholic party, and we will deal with that very much when we come to the preparations of the Second World War and when we are dealing with the Third Reich between 1933 and 1945. That center party that was responsible for a great, great part to put Hitler into power. In 1886, a quote says here, the center German Catholic party was hostile to the military projects presented by Bismarck. Antichrist Pope Leo XIII intervened in the German interior affairs in favor of Bismarck. His Secretary of State wrote to the Nuncio of Munich, quote, In view of the approaching revision of the religious legislation, which, as we have reasons to believe, will be carried out in a conciliatory manner, the Holy Father wishes that the center Roman Catholic German Party promote in every possible way the projects of the military. Unquote. This is what Joseph Rovan has to say. Quote, German diplomacy intervenes. It is already an old habit at the Vatican to make the Pope exercise his influence over the Centrum Catholic part Party so as to favor the military projects. The German Catholics are going to speak about the great political mission of Germany, which is, at the same time, a universal moral mission. And another word for universal is Catholic. The Zentrum, or Center, makes itself also responsible for the prolong uh, prolongation of a reign which, from blustering and weakness, warlike speeches over naval armaments to more warlike harangues will eventually lead Germany to catastrophe. The Zentrum enters the war of 1914 convinced of the uprightness, purity and moral integrity of its country's leaders of the agreement of their plans and program with the plans of eternal justice. Unquote. As we can see, the papacy had done what was necessary to implant this conviction. Besides, as Monsignor Fruwerth said in 1914, quote, Germany is the base on which the Holy Father can and must establish great hopes. Unquote. 
And there, of course, you have a reason again why Pope Leo XIII said that he wants Germany to become the sword of the Roman Catholic Church. He said that to the German Emperor. And I quote that in the book Behind the Dictators, which I also read on my channel. You can look up the playlist, which is... Uh, which link is also provided in the description box of this video. Germany is the base on which the Holy Father can and must establish great hopes. Germany was the arm, the military arm, of the Roman Catholic Church in the First World War and also in the Second World War, but only to pay dearly for it. And that all was planned because the Jesuits are on both sides, always. The Jesuits are on both sides. This ends the reading of the book The Secret History of the Jesuits today in this chapter 9 that we were reading and we will continue next time in the next uh, in the next part, section 5, that is called the Infernal Cycle, and in chapter 1, which deals with the First World War. Now we have dealt with everything building up to the very First World War, and next time we will go and speak about the First World War. And from that we will go over to the Second World War. And don't miss it, I can tell you. I... I'm reading now on page 115 of 197, so we still have more than 80 pages to go, and I can advise you to miss nothing. And if this is the first video that you are watching of this series, then go back, click on the playlist, which, is, which link is provided in the description box of this video, and watch all parts of this secret history of the Jesuits by the book from Edmond Paris from 1975. It will be worth your while. You will gain understanding. So, this was it so far. Until next time, Joggler66 from Hour of the Truth signing off says God bless you and bye bye. A special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government. Uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, They've been in preparation and in, in, in through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, Welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine of the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, 
uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.